This is a video tutorial for my first novel. It's called Darling If You Love Me Would You Please Please Smile. And this is a book that I wrote actually to correct something in the past that I hadn't stepped up to. I, I need to kind of explain a little bit about the surroundings of what happened. You see what happened was when I was in grade 7 and 8, those were the two worst years of my life. And I think for a lot of people, those are like the transition years when you're very awkward and you're you're going from child to adulthood, or at least what you think is adulthood in, in high school. And you're basically trying to figure out who you are, what you stand for. And during my years in grade 8 especially, those that was like a turning point in my life. And the turning point... Uh, involved a moment that I didn't step up and I wish I had. I wished I had so much that years later I corrected that in writing Darling If You Love Me Would You Please Please Smile. It's a teen novel about a girl named Zainab. Now what happened with me, you see, coming to Canada when I was in 1965, we were really poor. And I talk about this in one of my other uh, uh, tutorials on wanting more, my book. This is actually more almost like a book talk, between a book talk and a tutorial. If you had the students watch this, they're not going to, it doesn't have any real spoilers for the book, so it would be okay. Uh, so basically, I grew up in, in a small town called Dundas, Ontario. In uh, not, we we arrived there about 1966. We arrived in Canada in 1965, and we were really poor. We struggled. We were immigrants. We were really poor. My father first got a job for about seven dollars an hour. He was a tool and die maker. But within a year of buying the house in Dundas, my father got laid off, and my little brother and sister were born. Now there were four kids in the family. We could have gone on welfare, but he refused. He said, no, why would I take charity when I have two strong hands? I can work. And in fact, I think my father's example really affected me personally when I was growing up. His work ethic uh, is something that I strive to. So what happened was he, 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 he lost his job. He went out and he got another job. Only this time it was only for $2.35 an hour. And many times, he every time overtime would come up, uh, he would he would grab it. And sometimes that meant he worked 16 hours a day, you know, from 8 o'clock in the morning till 12 o'clock at night for $2.35 an hour, a time and a half for like the overtime. And he did this as much as he could. And even then, a lot of the time, at the end of the month, when my parents paid their bills, there was only $5 a week when they paid their electricity, hydro, mortgage, everything like that. There was $5 a week left over with which to buy food for six people. Most of the time we ate dill weed and potatoes because it was cheap and filling. We, I, filling. I grew up very poor, and yet he had he had moved us to Dundas, which is a, a kind of an upper middle class neighborhood, and he moved us there because he wanted us to have access to better schools. But because of that, because of that differential between myself and the kids around me, I mean, we were so poor. I couldn't afford the nice clothes, and all of a sudden, it really mattered in grade seven and eight. It really mattered what you wore. And back then it was the jeans. You see what happened was growing up in Dundas, I started at an elementary school. And I used to get bullied a lot. Almost every day after school I had like a different bu bu bully waiting to beat me up. But it didn't really get bad that bad until I got to grade 7 and 8 because here I had to go to a middle school. It was a different school. My older sister by this time, she was in high school. And then my younger brother and sister, they were back in elementary, and I was all alone in this middle school. And the worst thing was that I had no friends. I had absolutely no friends. And I, in fact, I had a lot of enemies. And what happened was growing up was so different. And back then, I didn't, I didn't wear this or anything like that. I actually tried to blend in. Uh, growing up so different in that elementary school, the kids would watch every single thing you did. You know, like when you made a mistake because you were brown, you know, uh, and, th and th these were kids who thought we were brown because we were dirty. And that's what they said. They said, oh, if you go home and take, take a lot of baths, you'll get white like us. And we actually tried. It didn't work. Uh, we stayed brown. We got cleaner, but we stayed brown. Uh, so these were kids every time I did something dumb. And yeah, you're going to do something dumb. The kids would always notice and they would keep track of it. So they knew every dumb thing I'd ever done. And you know, you're awkward. You're always being watched. You're being bullied. You're, you never know when you're going to be ambushed. So it makes for a very um, precarious situation when you're growing up. So they would remember every stupid thing I'd done since kindergarten. And they would never let me forget it. And then when we moved to, uh, when I had to go to this middle school, 
I was hoping to make a new start. I was actually the, one of those weird kids who actually wants to move because I thought maybe if I moved, I could make a new start. These kids wouldn't know all uh, my past. It never happened. My father, we stayed there. In fact, they still live in Dundas. So what happened, I had to come to this middle school. I had no friends. I had a lot of enemies. And all the kids who came with me from that other school, uh, they told all the new kids everything about me. So there was no chance I was going to make any friends. Now, in the new school, in the middle school, there were two boys in particular. They were like the kings of the school. They were, you know, the popular group and stuff. There was John. And the thing about John, he was really good looking. Okay, It was no surprise that he was so popular. On the other hand, uh, his cohort, his... Uh, partner in crime was Rick and the thing about Rick was he was actually quite ugly but he had a very nice body so he was really popular too and John and Rick they were like the kings of the school they wore all of the best clothes and they had a, 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 a around them they had a bunch of bimbo girls and these were like the popular group now I wanted to be friends with them because I thought they're cool they're funny you know they're popular and I thought you know I had read all those stories that you know with the shy geeky kid you know other people they they see the good in that person and they start to recognize it and all that baloney so I thought it would be possible I never realized that I was actually already at the bottom there was no way that these popular kids would ever be my friend I never thought it. and and the fact is I could have befriended some of the other kids in the class but I thought they were all a bunch of losers and I thought oh they'll just bring me down I didn't re I didn't realize I was already at the bottom now John and Rick they they took pains to make my life difficult even more difficult and one day in fact what happened this was in grade 7 and John he waited until the teacher left the classroom which should have been my first clue and he presented me with a gift in front of the whole class. It was it was a beaut it was a it was beautiful. It was a little white box with a beautifully tied red ribbon around it. And he said, Roxana, this is for you. And the first thing I thought, I looked at this thing and I thought, it's a trap. There's something in that that box, that little tiny box, that's a trap. It's insulting. He's gonna be making fun of me. But then I thought, well, what if it isn't? What if this is a peace offering? <laughs> what if he feels bad for all the mean things he did and, and he's trying to make it up to me and he's giving me this gift? And the thing is, I mean, I had never received a good looking gift. I, we, we, we didn't do birthdays. Like in Big Red Lollipop, when we didn't do birthdays. Once a year, we got a gift, and it was on Eid. Eid is after the month of fasting, you know, Eid al-Fitr, and, and we got a gift. And because gift wrapping paper costs money, it was never wrapped beautifully. Like, I'd never received a beautiful-looking gift. My parents would wrap it in newspaper. They said, well, what does it matter? You're going to rip it anyways. So, so I had never received a good-looking gift. And here John was giving me this gift, and I, and I thought, well, maybe he feels bad. So against my better judgment, I took it. I opened it up and inside there was a dog collar and John and all those bimbo girls they start howling with laughter like this is the funniest thing in the world that basically he just called me a dog I still thought I had a chance to be their friends uh, later on in grade 8 uh, they 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 got more organized one day they actually planned it all out they were going to uh, do something and this was a day that was raining so I was wearing my raincoat now back then the new style of raincoats were these tiny little jump bomber jackets they didn't really keep you dry but they you looked nice when they were getting wet they just went up to your waist and they had like a little fringe hood they were really cute you know and my father said why would you spend so much money on a tiny little jacket like that when you can get this big trench coat much cheaper and he got it he bought it like two sizes too big because he thought I would grow into it and back then the new style of umbrellas were these tiny little collapsible umbrellas they were so cute they got so small and my father said well why would you spend so much money on a tiny little umbrella like that when you can get this big this big one much much cheaper so he got me this big clunky umbrella so I was coming home it was rainy day so I was coming home they had it all planned John and all those bimbo girls they were at the bottom of the stairs and they were just waiting and I came running down the stairs and I stopped at the landing and I thought why are they just standing there looking at me why are they just watching me are they going to beat me up or something so I just stopped there and, and I paused and Rick you know the ugly guy the ugly, ugly popular guy right he comes running down the stairs and he stops on the landing right beside me. And right in front of his audience, John and all those bimbo girls, he puts his arm around me. And he says in front of his audience, he goes, Ooh, Roxana, I like your physique. 
And John and all those bimbo girls, they start howling with laughter, like this is the funniest thing in the world that Rick would be coming on to me. Now, I'm not advocating violence. There really are better ways of handling such a situation, but I'm only human. And I had that big umbrella. So I took it and I whacked Rick in the stomach with it. And he bent over and he started cursing. And I ran down the stairs right through John and all those bimbo girls. And I ran all the way home because I thought they were going to come and beat me up. I still thought I had a chance to be their friends. Uh, a few days later, they tried again. Only this day, it wasn't uh, raining. This day, it was like, it was okay. So I was riding my bike home. And back then, the new style of bikes were these fancy 10-speed racing bikes. It was when they were first invented. They were so light. You could pick them up with one hand. And they had the curly racing bar handles and all the gears and everything. They were really they were really neat. Now my father said, why would you spend so much money on a fancy bike like that when you can get this no-speed bike much cheaper? So he got me this light blue, no speed back pedal brake kind of bike, you know, with the wire basket on the front. And it was so high. It was like up to here on me. He thought I would grow into it. And it was so heavy. You had to pick it up with both hands. It was really, really heavy. It was so clunky. So I was riding home on my heavy, solid, no speed back pedal brake kind of bike. And John and Rick and all those bimbo girls, they come riding up along me, alongside me on their nice, light, 10-speed racing bikes. And John, he comes closer and closer, and he looks at me like this. And the first thing I did was I actually tried riding faster to get away from them. But the, I was on that heavy, solid, no-speed bike. They were on those nice, light, 10-speed racing bikes. They had no problem keeping up with me. And John kept coming closer and closer, and he looked at me like this, and he goes, and he starts making kissy noises like that. And Rick and all those bimbo girls, they're howling with laughter like this is the funniest thing in the world that John would be coming on to me. Now again, I tried riding faster, but I couldn't get away. It, I was on that heavy, heavy, hit solid bike and he was on that nice light 10 speed racing bike with all the gears. He had no trouble keeping up with me. And he kept coming closer and closer and going <coughs> like that. And they're laughing and everything and I'm thinking, oh. But then, you see, he made a mistake. He came too close. He came within range. And he was going like, like that. And all it took was a, a kick. And he went thunk right over. And I raced off. And Rick and all those bimbo girls, they were laughing now because he had fallen over like that. And I raced away because I, I, I thought they were going to come and beat me up. I still thought I had a chance to be their friends. Now, like I said, there were other kids in the classroom that I could have befriended, but I didn't because I thought they were losers. And one of them in particular, her name was Betty. And the thing about Betty was that she had enormous breasts. John and Rick and all those bimbo girls, they used to call her Betty Big Boobs when she wasn't around because her breasts were enormous. Now, I never called her that. I wasn't mean to her, but I wasn't her friend either because I thought she was like, a loser okay I, she was awkward she was yeah I thought she was a loser so I thought oh she's just, she's only going to bring me down I wasn't her friend but when John and Rick and all those bimbo girls used to say those things about her I never said anything because I thought well I've got my own problems that's her problem and I actually did believe that in that whole school that my life was the most miserable I couldn't imagine that somebody might have it worse you know, I thought mine was it. Mine was as low as you could go. I'm poor, I'm brown, there's no way I can fit in, uh, and all of that. Now, what happened was one day in grade 8, um, Betty didn't come to school that day. And I thought, well, maybe she's sick. But then the rumor went around the whole school that Betty had actually tried to kill herself. She had tried to commit suicide. And when I heard, I felt incredibly guilty. Because when John and Rick and all those bimba girls were calling her those names, I didn't say anything. And I realized at that moment, I thought, you know, by not saying anything, when somebody is putting else, somebody else down, when you don't say anything about it, you're actually participating by not saying anything. And I felt really, really guilty. And the other thing was, you see, I mean, I had thought about it. I, there were times when I got so lonely. It was so difficult. There were times when I had thought about killing myself, too. But there were two things that stopped me. The first was my faith, because I believe in God. And in my religion, in Islam, like, any, like many other religions, if you kill yourself, you're going to burn in hell. And I thought, I don't want to burn in hell. It was not 
an option for me. I mean, there were times when it got so bad, I actually started praying for death. Then I found out you're not supposed to do that either. You're supposed to pray for relief. So I would pray for relief, but I really wanted death. I really just wanted to die because I thought, I thought this is my life. I have been stuck with these people since kindergarten. They are going to hound me for the rest of my life. Not true. I thought this is, it's never going to get any better. Not true. The, those two years, grade seven and eight, were the worst years of my life. My life has only gotten better. <laughs> I never imagined when I was in grade seven and eight, I was going through all of that. I never imagined that I, I would grow up to become a, a Canadian children's author. I'd win all these awards and I'd go all over the world as a Canadian children's author. And I had like a, a fantastic husband and four amazing kids. And I have like seven grandkids. They're so cute. And I never imagined my life would turn out the way that it has. I was in my misery and I thought, this is it. This is my life. So that was the, the so the, the thing that stopped me from killing myself, really the first and most important thing was my faith. But there was also something else. Because uh, because of the books. I used to read books. I read books. I lived in books. And I think you need to find some way to keep going. My coping mechanism were books, which is actually pretty healthy. Like, I mean, drugs will only take you down, but books actually make you smarter when you're, when you're reading them. And I basically read through the entire... Uh, a children's collection at the Dundas Public Library. I read through all the genres. I started with mystery. I went through adventure and, and uh, historical fiction, science fiction, fantasy. The only thing I couldn't read was horror because I, I, it scared me too much. So I read through basically all these books. And when I was reading, I could be someone else. I could be somewhere else. And I could forget about my problems for a little while. Forget about all the bullying and all the harassment and the way they kept telling me that, you know, you're nothing, you're nothing, you're nothing. I could forget about all of that while I was reading books. Maybe Betty didn't have that. <sighs> so I was sitting there thinking, oh, I got to do something. I feel so guilty. I got to help her. And I thought, you know what I can do? I thought when she comes back to school, I'm going to make it up to her. I'm going to try to be her friend. Because, you know, like, she's going to be so embarrassed. Everybody knows that she tried to kill herself. And I thought, I will reach out. I'll be your friend. So I thought, okay, that's what I'm going to do. That's going to help me get over my guilt in, in terms of how I contributed to the things. Now, what happened was um, my teacher, my grade 8 teacher, his name was Mr. Picotti. He was our room teacher. He had to go to the office for something for a moment. He was wonderful. Um, while he left, Rick, you know, the ugly popular guy, he stood up in front of the whole class and he put on a very official, smug-looking face, expression on his face. And he said, in front of the whole class, he made an announcement. He said, it has now come to our attention that our dear Betty has tried to end it all. We will now have a two-minute silence for our dear Betty. And then John and Rick and all those bimbo girls, they start snickering and giggling through their own two minute silence. And I'm looking at these people and I couldn't believe it. I couldn't believe that people could be that cruel. Here they had gone ahead and they had basically uh, uh, pushed her to do this. And now they were snickering about it. And I looked at them and I got so, so mad. And sometimes anger, you know, it can be, it can actually be a good thing. I got so angry and I thought, I thought, why doesn't anybody say anything to stop these people? And I looked at, and I thought, I looked around at the other losers in the class, and they were all sitting there like this. Not one of them said one word for that poor girl. And I thought, well, why don't I say something? I thought, I can't. She's not even here. You know, they're just going to jump on me. And I, and I just got so mad. And I looked at John and Rick and all those bimbo girls, and I got so mad. And you know what I did? I thought, you know, I don't want to be your friend anymore. And I thought, I don't even want you guys to like me. Because if you like me, then maybe I'm like you in some way. And I don't want to be like you. I thought, you go your way. I'm going to go mine. And I thought, just wait until Betty comes back. When Betty comes back, I'm going to be her friend. I'm going to really make it up to her. Now, the problem was that Betty never did come back to that school. To this day, I don't know what happened to her. I'm hoping she's okay. But she never came back. And, and what happened was John and Rick and all those bimbo girls, they ended up going to a different high school. Here I thought I was stuck with these people for the rest of my life. 
not true. They ended up going to a different high school. They went to like the Jock High School and I went to like the Brainy High School in Dundas. And I never saw them again. I would love to see them again. You know, I would have loved to see them again. But I never did. And then I ended up moving to Toronto and everything like that. I've never seen them again. You know, you, you're th you think you're stuck with these people for the rest of your life and you're not. That's something, you know, like young people, maybe they don't realize that they, you will leave them and you will make another new child. And I, I left and I went to went to Toronto and I got married and everything like that. Years later, when I was I was de deciding, you know, I think I want to be an author. My my grade eight teacher, by the way, Mr. Bricotti, he was the one who first told me you, I should be an author. And I thought, okay, I'm going to try to be an author. And the first thing I did was I tried to write write picture books. I thought, oh, they're short, they're easy. <laughs> they're actually a lot harder than they, than you would think. And so then I thought, well, maybe I should try writing a novel. And I thought about it, and I thought, you know what I could do? Because it still bothered me. This was close to about 13 years later. It still bothered me that I hadn't had the guts to get up and, and tell John and Rick off. So I thought, what if I write a story about a girl who's going through basically the same situation? And what if this girl in my story, Zainab, what if she has the courage that I didn't have. What if she gets to this point where they're having this two-minute silence for this poor girl who's tried to kill herself and she has the courage that I didn't have and she gets up and she tells them off. That became the climactic scene in Darling, If You Love Me, Would You Please, Please Smile. Basically, I wrote it to correct that wrong. And I'm pleased to say that it actually was up for like three major Canadian awards. It has done really, really well. It sold out and all that kind of stuff. And I've just recently, I've republished. I had publisher problems. It came up at the beginning of my career. And um, I had publisher problems. And so what I've done is I've republished it as an ebook. So it is available. The link is, is, is in the follow-up information. And it, it makes a very good read aloud. For I, I find both girls and boys really find it. And what I'm planning to do, what I'm working on right now, is I'm working on a project called Get the Bully Off Your Back, where I'm going to be talking about different strategies young people can use to overcome this kind of bullying. Because, I mean, I did. I'm not, nobody bullies me anymore. Believe me, nobody bullies me. <laughs> they don't care. So I, I, I'm going to talk about the strategies that I use to go from victim. I mean, it's like I had a target on my back from like a victim to the point where now I'm at the point and nobody bullies me. And the thing is I dress the way I want. And a lot of it is because I thought, you know what, I'm going to do what I want. I'm going to be who I am. I don't care. I really don't care anymore. Uh, I want to thank you uh, for, for listening to this uh, book talk and tutorial. And I hope uh, you will find it useful for your students. Please check out the other resources. There's a, a very good teacher guide for the book. There's also a teacher guide for the presentation I do on the book. And the presentation is called Get the Bully Off Your Back. So, um, and I want to thank you for listening. Thank you very much.